Oh, terrific. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Hina Shah, and I am a senior analyst at the Kansas Health Institute. Um, I facilitated some meetings um, during the task force and the working groups in December. My colleague, Carrie Bruffett, had filled in in January, but I'm back and ready and excited to be with all of you. Um, we do have a few people in the room. We have uh, working group members, we have staff, and we also have supplemental experts with us today. So um, I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Emma, to share our agenda for the day so we can go over it. Please remember, we only have about 90 minutes. It goes by really quick and we have a lot to go through. Your topic now for the month of February is rebalancing of home and community-based services. So last month you had your first topic and this month you'll be working on this topic now. So you'll hear from supplemental experts and be able to discuss during this meeting. Um, there are a few other supplemental experts actually um, that we will have, not just those that are on this agenda. So along with Dan Goodman, we will also have Lacey Hunter from KDADS and then Shelly May, um, I apologize for the misspelling, it is Shelly May from Johnson County, will be um, speaking with us and then either Shan or Emily from Blue Stem, the PACE program there. And so we do have a few supplemental experts this morning. Now remember that the goal is really to discuss the topic now and we're going to develop recommendations at your next meeting in, um, later in February. And so with that, um, I also want you to keep your meeting commitments in mind. So come ready to discuss and compromise. Let's keep our remarks succinct and on topic. Don't hesitate to ask questions, um, especially clarifying questions, and then all make sure we start and end on time. So to kick us off this morning, I want everyone to say their name and kind of their title or organization. And then briefly in like one to two sentences, what do you want everyone to keep really top of mind as you start talking about rebalancing of home and community-based services? So I will call out names and I'm gonna start with Dan Goodman. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Goodman. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Long-Term Sports and Services for KDADS. Um, can, you, can you share the question again? Yes, it's just as we're thinking through this topic of rebalancing of home and community-based services, what do you want everyone to really keep top of mind as they're listening to supplemental experts and really talking about the topic area? Well, um, I just think it's important that we have a, a well-balanced system that, that serves both, uh, uh, give uh, Kansans options in terms of where they want to receive their care, whether it's in a uh, facility or community-based service. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, would you like to go next? Yes, I'm Jamie Gideon from the Alzheimer's Association. I'm the Director of Public Policy. Um, I would say the main thing I want to focus on is to make sure that, um, that the services truly um, um, address the needs of Kansans and that they have access to those services as well. Thank you. Next, Jan. Hello, um, Jan Kimbrell, Silverhaired Legislators, Morris County Rep. Um, I want to be sure that um, we're understanding the rebalancing uh, issues are uh, now <laughs> and not just, you know, I, I read some of this stuff, it's in the future. No, our future is now and we need to get get down to this and realize there's an, a big population of seniors and and we need this rebalancing now thank you thank you sarah sarah schlitter director of residential services at johnson county developmental supports and i would just say uh really focusing on um, access to service as well as uh, flexibility and service delivery thank you annette Annette Graham, and I am the uh, president of the Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging. And um, my thought would be that to keep in mind and make opportunities for older adults and their caregivers so that their voices are heard 
and uh, pay attention to what they say their needs are, uh, what kind of services, what kind of programs, and where where they want services. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, Linda Mowbray, Kansas Healthcare Association, Kansas Center for Assisted Living. I think for me, one of the the biggest things to keep in mind with the rebalancing um, initiative and, and efforts is that uh, all options of community-based service settings um, stay viable, stay on the table, specifically talking about um, assisted living, residential health care, and Home Plus. If you look through a lot of the literature that speaks about HCBS programs, Adult Day is mentioned, but those other three options that I just listed um, are not, and, and we need to, to keep our eye on that. Thank you. Sean Sullivan? I'm Sean Sullivan, CEO of Midland Care Connection. I would just emphasize almost kind of what Linda Mowbray just did, but the reason that uh, Assisted Living Home Plus uh, residential care is often so important in the continuum of rebalancing is it provides a housing component that often is needed and is a gap uh, in a lot of communities and uh, a little extra support that often is not there as well. So I'm going to add that in. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy. Hi, my name is Stacy Carson. I'm a registered nurse at Johnson County Developmental Supports. And I think uh, what I would find very important is what others have kind of reiterated is making access to services equitable uh, for all Kansas seniors. Thank you. Thank you. Tanya. Good morning, I'm Tanya Dorf-Brenner and I'm the Executive Director at Oral Health Kansas. I would say um, just keep in mind um, whole person care and just everything that a person needs in order to be healthy in their lives. Uh, just making sure that's a part of the conversation and in the uh, thought process. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, you. Heather, about is Heather person. Brown on by chance? Yeah. Okay, that's all. Yes, I am. So oh, hello. There you are. Hi, um, Heather Brown, Johnson County Developmental Supports. I think as we look at rebalancing, I would just like to um, keep in mind that, um, you know, the, the population that receives H HCBS services um, has some pretty unique needs as they get older and as they age. And I think that the way things sit currently, um, we're not in a position to best serve that population right now. So uh, just keeping in mind unique needs as that population ages. Thank you. Uh, Kendra, are you on? Just want to make sure I'm not missing you. All right. And then Senator O'Shea is unable to make it this meeting. She sent me a note yesterday. So now I'm going to move on to some of our supplemental experts or other experts on. Lacey, did you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, I am Lacey Hunter. I am the Commissioner of Survey Certification and Credentialing for the Kansas Department of Aging and Disability Services. Uh, my commission oversees the Abuse, Neglect, and Exploitation hotline that I will be talking to you all about a little bit today. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Shelly? Hi, <clears throat> Shelly May. Um, I'm the Deputy Director with Johnson County Developmental Supports. And the term rebalancing always um, makes me a little nervous because it indicates that there would be some savings captured somewhere. And I just want to, I don't think we can have a conversation about services without mentioning workforce and um, not being able to pay wages to attract um, self-directed personal care services across all waivers. And so I want that to kind of remain um, always in the back of people's mind that um, as a system, HCBS, the funding and the ability to attract and pay workers um, is critical. Thank you. And then Emily. Emily, are you speaking? It says you have low bandwidth, so I wasn't sure. Uh, 
All right, Xavier, maybe you could work with Emily to see um, if there's another way to get her online. All right, okay. and, and then I see a, a few others. So Stephanie from KDADS as well, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Stephanie Wolik and I am the Legal Division Manager for KDATS. Um, I will be here to support Lacey in her presentation today. Terrific, thank you. And then um, I have a colleague, Emma Urich from KHI who is on. And then Sean, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Sean Marshall with Legislative Research and I'm just here to monitor the conversation and see what you guys come up with, so. Sounds great. Have I missed anyone on the call? I think I've got a full screen of everyone. All right, Emily, are you online before I move on? All right, well, we'll give you a chance. So now we're gonna move on and kind of hear from um, KDATS and also our other supplemental experts. So I'm going to invite Dan Goodman first to present some data to you. And this is data that you had requested at your last meeting and also um, other supplemental experts based on talking with your chairs as well on who to invite. And so Dan and Lacey are going to present data first and discuss. So um, Emma, do you mind sharing those charts? Good morning. Um, today I'm gonna to share three chart charts with you. The first is a snapshot of the HCBS caseload across all the our waivers uh, that can, that do serve a 60 plus population. Uh, this snapshot is of December, 2021. Uh, you will notice that uh, there are 6,157 Kansans that were served on the Frail Elder Waiver, uh, 2,794 on the Physically Disabled Waiver, uh, 1,186 on the IDD Waiver, and 161 on the Brain Injured Waiver. So the total number of folks served in December uh, was 10,298 uh, 60 plus Kansans on the waiver, HCBS waivers. The next uh, chart I want to move to is um, the one in regard to monthly average caseload comparison uh, by state fiscal year. Again, I will stress that these are monthly average averages, not actuals. In 2021, on average, nursing facilities served 9,571 per month, while the HCBS FE waiver served 5,528 per month. You will note that the 2021 nursing facility residents were down about 1,000 residents compared to FY 2020, and uh, HCBS was up almost 700 clients during the same period. And then finally, moving to the third, third chart, uh, you will find uh, WSU's population forecast for the 85 plus population in Kansas. Uh, you will note that 2020, there is about 79,085 plus Kansans. By 2030, that population grows to 120,000. By 2040, it grows to over 200,000. And by and finally, by 2050, we're over a quarter million, uh, 85 plus folks in Kansas. Um, that that will conclude those three charts. Are there questions, concerns? And so we're going to keep this pretty interactive, everyone. Um, as each person presents, feel free to ask questions. And so, are there any questions from the group? Yes, this is Annette Graham, Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Dan, do you uh, have any information on the, the uh, cost for the other waivers? Or just the FE waiver? Um, I don't, I didn't bring any costs, Annette, for any of the waiver, not even the FE. Um, I'm, we probably can get those costs. Okay. Uh, what, what are you looking at? You look at average case, average, uh, cost of planning care or yes. the overall cost of the waivers themselves? I think it might be good to have both. Uh, you know, I know that we can see from from the data the, that the FE waiver has a, a higher number of people on it. 
uh, but I, it would be interesting to see what's the average plan of care cost per individual um, and also the cost for the, the total cost for each waiver. For the six, for the sixty plus sixty plus population, just it, just in general, that the total the waivers, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. This is Sean Sullivan from Midland Care. Two questions. One, can you go back to the slide and and what was the total decrease from year to year in nursing homes compared to the total increase in the frail elderly waiver? That was 1,000, about 9% less in nursing homes. And then what was the increase in the FE waiver from 20 to 21? Is that information you could get? So, sorry, Sean, I was on mute. What was your specific question there? The, the nursing home caseload went from, went down 1,000. The front right. only caseload, it looks like went up 700. 700. Yeah, and then pace went up about another probably two hundred. So that almost it, one to one. So you're missing about a hundred. Yeah, no, not that it's a necessarily a direct correlation. So appreciate that. And the second second question is whether you all have any information on the number of beds per capita we have, or number of residents nursing home residents per capita we have. So go back. Rewind 10 years ago, we, were, we had like the fifth highest number, fourth, the fourth or fifth highest number of nursing home beds in the country per capita. Wondering whether we've, whether that's still true today or uh, certainly there's been a eight to nine percent decrease in the number of these Medicaid people on in nursing homes. Likely in direct correlation to COVID. Um, so that would happen all across the country. So it'd be interesting to know as we talk about rebalancing, what the comparison is in Kansas of nursing home reliance, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I know where you're heading. You, how far did you want? I mean, just wherever we can find another. Uh, yeah, point just, somewhere it, it, in the past. I, I would be interested just in the latest comparison point of where we are today. All right. Yeah, I can do that. This is Linda Mowbray. My question is is along the same lines as as uh, Sean Sullivan's, and it relates to that one thousand individuals down from the nursing homes, the seven hundred up on HCBS caseload, as well as an increase on pace. Is there any tracking mechanism across the um, MCOs? to see if these are the same individuals or if there is a percentage that is the same individuals that we actually have begun a rebalance or is this just completely COVID related with new people needing care and choosing HCBS and people leaving or, or are passing away in the nursing homes? Um. I, I, you know, I'm not sure what what the uh, what the MCOs can provide us. Um, uh, anything I would say, Linda, would be just uh, pretty subjective. I, I I think it's probably pretty directly related to COVID. I mean, that dramatic of a of a shift, I think, has it speaks to maybe fears of the pandemic and you know families and. Okay, so. I, I guess maybe reframing the question, Linda Mowbray, Kansas Healthcare Association, would be what kind of data do the MCOs have about people that they have um, transitioned from nursing home to um, HCBS services, whether assisted living or in the community at large? Sean Sullivan, Midland Care, I'll, I'll pipe in. They, I think, I think that actually was the genesis of Annette's question. Is, is the same? Is, is can they can they pull or can you all pull the average plan of care service units, average service units from the MCOs, and look at that for those that have transitioned to the community versus just average 
on their caseload as there's been an increase on the level of services they provided as the number of nursing home residents have decreased. I could just say for the pace side of things, that has absolutely been a factor the last year and a half is the, the needs of the people that we are seeing and the acuity of the people that we are now enrolling has increased significantly. So uh, that's seen through federal data that we have of, of what are, what's called HCC scoring or uh, diagnosis coding that we have. So my, my guess would be the same for the MCOs, but it'd be interesting to hear, see if, that, if that's true. Annette Graham, Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging. I think another data point that might be uh, illuminating for this kind of issue uh, about that change in the reduction in numbers of people at nursing facilities versus in the Medicaid population versus the HCBS FE program would be, and I don't know if we've looked at that data, the data from CARE, which is the client assessment referral evaluation over the last couple of years. I know that when we've looked at that, um, at the area agencies on aging, we see a, a significant change there. And the number, if you start from 2019 and then go through 2021, you can see the change in the number of people seeking those assessments. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? All right, then, um, Lacey, did you want to speak about the uh, adult protective service items as it relates to facility settings? Um, I don't have much information on uh, APS services. Dan, is that? Yeah, I, I believe uh, the plan was to have Chrissy Kativ. Is that correct? to talk about. So Chrissy um, spoke at the meeting on Tuesday um, to that group because they were talking about um, APS services. So I wasn't sure if Lacey was going to speak to. I think she's most, yeah, I, I think she came prepared mostly to speak on the, um, the hotline and how we process concerns that come in to us regarding facilities. Okay. Um, does this group want to speak about that? Otherwise, I might follow up with Lacey and have her connect with the other working group that is really focused on um, looking at APS and kind of how things are logged with abuse concerns. Maybe Lacey, you could speak briefly, maybe a minute or two on kind of how the program works. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so our our agency is tasked with running the abuse, neglect, and exploitation hotline for medical care facilities. Um, we receive calls from um, everyone. And so individuals who live in adult care homes, individuals who have loved ones or friends living in there, um, individuals who work at adult care homes, um, we do get uh, referrals from the APS, um, our partners at uh, the APS hotline over at DCF. So um, one of the things our hotline does is works with other uh, reporting agencies within our state to make sure that when we receive a call that we're routing it to the right place, as do they when they receive a call. We all have that kind of mutual understanding and, and working relationship. Um, when we receive calls, um, we one of the first things that we do do is identify um, uh, for what uh, for what reason they're calling um, and to to ensure that they are calling um, regarding an individual who is residing in a medical care facility um, and it is not a an individual within the community. Um, that is probably one of the big breaks between us and APS is um, on where you go to call. Um, so once we've identified that they are, um, in fact, uh, referring to an individual living within a facility, um, we, our hotline is staffed with registered nurses. Um, they then begin to start their line of questioning to gather information on um, what the situation is, um, including uh, many, many details, um, unfortunately, that I, I can't go into too much information on that. But um, what is done with those details is that they are then um, assessed and triaged, um, and a lot of that is outlined by federal guidance in the State Operations Manual Chapter 5. 
um, and they are assigned a triage level anywhere from immediate jeopardy um, and then down to uh, non-IJ um, low. Um, and then we have things that are, are, are of no action to us, which are things like referral to another agency. Um, things that happen immediately when, when we do receive a uh, allegation of abuse, neglect, or exploitation um, is we do uh, we do make sure that those referrals are sent to the local law enforcement as well as the attorney general's office for um, them to do an investigation as well. Um, is that a bit of a, I can keep going, I could go on forever, but I don't want to, to keep you. No, thank you, Lacey. That actually is a topic for the other working group, and I apologize that we crossed wires on this. Um, I will invite you to the next working group A meeting about this subject matter in January 25th when they're putting their recommendations together. Um, but I will move this working group on to continue to talk about rebalancing of HCBS. So thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to invite... I'm going to invite Shelly May, actually, um, if she wants to talk about kind of aging and the IDD population and any recommendations or areas of improvement that she wants to discuss. Thank you, Tina. Um, so as I mentioned um, during my introduction, uh, just the term rebalancing um, within a system that is chronically underfunded um, and the workforce issues that are facing not just the IDD waiver, but all waivers and particularly hitting hard the waivers, the people who use personal care assistance, being able to hire and retain workers to help support them in their home. I think some opportunities we have would be um, supported housing to look at um, programs for that. We have particular for folks who are on the IDD waiver that uh, the available funds that they have don't allow them to live more independently. They choose a uh, higher level service, if you will, a more costly service because they can afford the rent in a group home kind of scenario. Um, within the IDD waiver, there are very few service descriptions. So the uniqueness, I've heard people talk about like access and flexibility um, of services. So for example, there's one service residential that encompasses everything. It encompasses everything from 24-7, 365 care to um, someone who can live independently in an apartment. And so looking at where can we, where can we look at service descriptions and have more service descriptions available that um, more closely meet the needs of the person. Uh, and if there was something we could do in the, in the area of supported housing, to where people would be able to financially afford to live in a lesser restrictive setting. Um, also smart home technology and enabling technologies. There isn't anything within a waiver description that would pay for an evaluation and technical assistance and training for people to you know, not be reliant on staff, be able to be more independent in their own home, as well as a group home too. But there just isn't a mechanism for that right now. And, and with the workforce issues too, I think we need to have more conversations about how those things can be supported and paid for through a waiver instead of result always referring back to um, a physical staff person to provide that service. There's, <clears throat> within the IDD waiver, there's an annual functional assessment, which is kind of an odd thing when you consider that developmental disability is lifelong. And so the, we're supporting a system where there, people really are not changing from year to year and so I think looking at is that annual functional assessment really valid and needed? And is that a place where we can um, capture some savings if we're not performing? Maybe we can do it every 10 years um, just because people don't tend to change a lot um, when they have a developmental disability. The tool that's being used to, you know, the it's long been kind of criticized of 
not really assessing true need or level of service required. There has been some work going on at the state level to look at a different tool, but I that has stalled over the last couple years. And so I think continuing to look at really what's the best functional assessment that we can use that more accurately captures someone's level of need and how often do we really need to do a functional assessment for someone who has an intellectual and developmental disability. Another area is uh, behavioral health needs and opening up um, services across waivers that are inclusive of behavioral health needs. So not just on the IDD waiver, but other waivers having um, that more, kind of, I heard that too in some of the introductions, kind of the whole look at the person and evaluating all of their needs. And um, I think having the expertise within the waivers to also address those needs and not having to constantly seek outside of the system to find that resource. And then sometimes that resource is not um, what the person, you know, the behavioral health that's being offered is not geared towards folks who have an intellectual and developmental disability, and there's a lot of barriers to accessing the care and support they need. Home health um, was also something that was piloted in IDD, and I think it had some value. Um, the project didn't go, um, didn't have a lot of success, but I do think there were some lessons learned from that. Um, and the kind of the targeted case management, the way it's set up right now with some, it's very restrictive and, and also doesn't look at um, kind of the, the whole needs of the person. You get stuck in these kind of billing silos and <clears throat> to uh, not have like that unit billing, but look more comprehensively at like a monthly encounter so that people's needs are met. So there needs to be some uh, overhaul of the targeted case management and how can we have a service that more comprehensively meet, meets the needs and, and can help someone with their future plannings and being flexible with the future plannings and person-centered support planning that occurs with the IDD waiver. Um, and I think finally, um, just the, I, I mean, I, I can't say it enough with um, the personal care assistance. Uh, right now, um, it's the service, you know, if somebody goes to a 24, 7, 365, you know, care or they have their day services and their residential services all under the waiver, that's so much more costly than personal care services. And the more we can do to help people utilize that lesser expensive service that allows them to stay in their home, in the family home, as long as they can successfully, that will overall benefit the system. Um, we have just a fraction of people on the IDD waiver that are in residential services, and it's the most costly service there is. So if, if we can't support people in their own home or in their family home, they're going to move towards that more costly service of residential services. Um, so I would say just looking at the descriptions, um, having more unique descriptions of services that people can get. We, we have these big lumps of like just day services that encompasses everything from coming to a center to working, you know, independently on a job. Uh, same way with residential, it captures everything from living in your own apartment to living in a group home. And um, so people are kind of moving towards those uh, those more costly kinds of services because that's what's available in um, the waiver descriptions. And so, um, so yeah, more uniqueness, more service descriptions, uh, increasing rates as much as possible to be able to attract and retain workers, um, really looking at that personal care assistance, smart home technologies, enabling technologies, um, the supported housing, 
the um, you know a better model for targeted case management and uh, really looking at that functional assessment tool and behavioral health needs. And I think also looking at considering in the rebalancing um, the impact on physical health and ER, like ER usage and, and preventing hospitalization. It's always surprising to, I've been in the field for a long time and we're still talking about a waiver from institutional care when around 5% of people with IDD are actually in institutions. And so 95% of people are choosing home and community-based services. And it would be really nice to move forward to not talking about a waiver from institutional care, that just talking about community services and not applying institutional rules and regulations to people who are living in their own home. So I hope that's helpful um, <laughs> and kind of what you were hoping for um, this morning, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Shelley. For group members, what questions do you have? Jan? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, Silverhead legislator. Did I understand um, in, in one part of your presentation, you said um, you're doing um, annual assessments on the IDD uh, folks uh, and, and you wanted to perhaps push that out to maybe once every 10 years because you didn't see much change? Um, Correct. Yes. Okay. My, my red flag that went up is that as we age, um, the, you know, our physical um, changes c do come a little more rapidly in, in this period of, of aging we're talking about. And so if somebody, you know, may be solid, but 10 years from now, there's a whole different world going on for that person. Um, yes, I, I agree I with you. Me that is there some sort of red flag if you if you were to change it to the 10 years that when they saw a change in behavior, a change in physical that um, you wouldn't stop the reass or you wouldn't say, well, it hasn't been 10 years yet. We can't reassess. I mean, is there, if you were yeah. to trust it, that's where I see the, the every year assessment, whether it's quick, you know, um, but I'm just concerned that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree with you, Jan. That's a good point. And yes, absolutely. I think there should be a mechanism that if somebody has a change in their physical, mental, health, functional ability that they should have an assessment with closer in those times, that there would be something built in that if there was, that it could be requested. Um, but when you're looking at people come into the IDD waiver at age five, yeah. and then they can stay on the waiver, you know, I the trend is to, um, develop living situations where people can age in place. So yeah, they could be on age five all the way to, you know, end of life and to have an annual assessment for them. <laughs> it just seems like a place where we could look at, is this really needed and could we save money? But I am in total agreement if there's a, a change in physical, behavioral or functional that they should reevaluate. Okay, if I could follow up, then there would be a, or there is, or or will be a mechanism in place um, uh, for a, a, a cross conversation between the departments that are involved. So um, the, the nursing home um, and, or, and the doctor, some, I, I see is, um, miscommunication or no communication between the different um, groups that are, are caring, on the list for caring for a resident or a, a person at home. Um, so there would be um, some kind of mechanism that, that one could say to the other, hey, this is going on and maybe we need to look at this and instead of each separate one has to come to the same conclusion. Um, I, I guess, right. I, this is, yeah. Okay. yeah. This is just a, this is not happening. It is an annual assessment yeah. right now with the IDD waiver. This is just an idea of, yeah, yeah 
to yeah. talk about. So it, there's not even, I don't believe there's even a discussion happening okay. anywhere. This is, this, is, this is from Shelly May and my observation. Okay, thank you, thank you. Sean Sullivan, Midland. Shelly, can you, can you provide a little bit more background on kind of how the supportive, supportive housing model works, what you see, how it works, what's not working, maybe how that could be applied more widely to older adults, if that makes sense? Well, I think it would be involving other housing partners to create affordable and accessible housing. There's such a shortage of places where people can live or within the IDD waiver, there's people who choose to live in a group home because their monthly income, their monthly finances doesn't allow them to live more independently, that they live in a group home because they can afford it. And it prevents them from living in a less expensive option um, because they can't afford the rent there or the monthly expenses. So. Yeah, it would involve housing partners to help create more affordable and accessible housing. So that becomes that becomes an option for folks. So they're not relying on a more expensive service or arrangement just because their monthly finances. Sean Sullivan, Midland. So how, how prevalent is that either very independent housing arrangements versus more of a group home setting? How's how's that compare versus the prevalence today in the IDD world and then um, who, who, have, are the, who are yeah. the providers of both? Is it is it CDDOs, IDD providers? Kind of who who is that network now? Yes, ID yeah, IDD providers provide both those supports. Um, so they provide, and maybe not every agency. You know, some might only provide group home supports. Um, so I don't have the numbers. I could get that. I could try to get that for you. Um, the state used to keep a really nice um, kind of uh, monthly HCBS report of who lived, you know, if someone lived alone or if they lived in a group of folks, so was it three or more, was it four or more? So they used to keep a really nice spreadsheet of that, and I haven't seen that for quite a while, but I can try to get as close to that as possible. So I think there are providers who have tried to do some unique things with um, video monitoring and things like that to kind of help support the idea of people living more independently and not having 24-7 staff there just in case something happens. So that's where this, we're really talking about smart home technology and enabling technologies for people to be more independent, for there to be some safeguards without having a physical person present. Um, so, uh, I'm not, did I, you had a couple part question. Did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts? But yeah, this is Annette Graham, Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging. And Shelley, thank you for that. I mean, you bring up some great topics that are really, uh, and issues that are really cross-cutting for those 60 and older. So for individuals with IDD and then other, you know, other populations, older adults with physical disabilities, and then the frail elder, you know, those functional impairments. Certainly what we see is that need for affordable, accessible housing cut, cuts across. Um, and even for the FE a waiver population, age 65 and up, a lot of issues related to housing is there's very few assisted livings and homes plus that that are affordable. So if they even if they have waiver services, they have to pay for that housing, and often that really is a, a significant barrier. So finding affordable, accessible housing for this population can result in people seeking nursing home level care when. They could be served through a waiver or the PACE program or, or others, but if their income is low enough, they can't afford that housing, they can't find it, or it's not accessible. So um, some really good points, and uh, certainly that whole issue of smart home technology and how do we uh, amplify that and find other opportunities to bring that into these programs so that those technologies are helping people 
at 60 and older to continue to remain in their homes because we know that workforce shortage is only, you know, it's going to continue. That's that's a big challenge uh, and, and a big challenge in, you know, rural Kansas and across the state. So thank you for your presentation today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any other um, questions or discussion around this topic? All right. So then the last topic that I have that wasn't on your um, agenda actually is around the PACE program. Um, Kate Eds is working on expanding it. And so we have Emily, were you able to join now? Do you want to introduce yourself? Well, we have Emily Rains from Blue STEM, and then your own working group member, Sean, that could speak to kind of the PACE program expansion and maybe any barriers to providing care to more people um, or any recommendations or areas of improvement as it relates to rebalancing. Um, so, Absolutely. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Well, I do apologize for tech issues on our end and you not being able to see me, but I'm Emily Raines, the Director of Market Development and Intake with Gluestem PACE. Um, and as probably many of you know, uh, the PACE programs work uh, and partner with seniors 55 and better to, you know, live and be successful at home uh, by providing comprehensive medical care and supportive services. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest barriers uh, that that we have seen um, really has been, you know, kind of accurate and clear and competent information, you know, that's out in the community. And one of the uh, things that we have recently done is taken part uh, with a third party and a secret shopper um, project to really, uh, you know, work and see on the ADRC level um, what kind of information is is coming out and, you know, how we can and partner with those organizations to, uh, you know, really make sure that the information that's coming out is is accurate um, and, and certainly unbiased to provide this access to, to the PACE program. So um, we are, you know, really hot off the press with the information that has been provided. So I want to share just kind of general information in this setting is to not get the cart before the horse. But, um, you know, in the third party shop, it was uh, really clear that there's a lot of question um, amongst the call center folks related to the specifics of the PACE program. And part of that is understandable from the standpoint of, you know, PACE is only available in certain counties. Um, but what would be really helpful is um, a partnership to just really ensure um, training on the PACE program and then, you know, retraining as well as, you know, when new staff uh, begin. Because one of our concerns is that, you know, even if accurate information is shared, but it's shared, you know, kind of with a lack of understanding or uncertainty, which was identified um, in the shop, you know, it can put a question in folks' minds as far as, you know, is that, you know, is this a legitimate program? Is this, you know, really uh, something that I want to look into? So, um, you know, we really feel like, you know, that is the biggest barrier as far as um, just making sure uh, with staffing changes and just in general that the PACE program, you know, does re receive, you know, kind of equal representation to, you know, the other programs because PACE is in fact a cost savings program and and really working diligently to, to keep seniors in their homes, which we've heard a lot about um, today. So, so that is one of the, the big things uh, for us is just really ensuring that the information out there is helpful um, as well as, you know, some states have moved towards, like Oklahoma, for example, have, have moved towards, you know, when people, you know, reach out and they are looking at uh, services, you know, having a referral to PACE uh, be made so that folks can truly understand, you know, all of their options. And then because it's a cost savings measure to the state, um, obviously, you know, introducing folks to the PACE program and then, of course, making it up to them as to far as whether that's a good option for them or not um, would would be the goal, of course. Um, so, you know, that probably is is a, a barrier to us. Uh, something that's been helpful over the last couple of years has been the increase 
in the protected income, which has helped um, significantly create access to, to the PACE program services. So to those of you that were involved in that process, that has been really um, encouraging and has created more access um, to the PACE program. Um, what questions do you have? And Sean, this certainly. is Sean from Midland. Yeah. I, I, if, if it's helpful, I have a couple of slides that I do for legislative presentations just to give a background as to what PACE is and, and uh, the history of it in Kansas and where we're expanding. So if that's helpful, I could do that for two minutes. Yeah, do you want to go ahead and share, Sean? I was just going to ask you if you yeah. wanted to chime in as well. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so PACE, PACE is a, a program, just take a step back, because not many, there's a lot of people don't know much about it, uh, may have heard about it in passing uh, a little bit more over the last couple of years, but the program has been around since the late 60s, started in San Francisco as a community there was looking for alternatives to facility settings for keeping their elders and their parents at home. So they essentially took an adult day model and put it on steroids. And then over the number of next 20, 30 years, uh, established several demonstration sites around the country that was made a permanent program of Medicare in the late 90s. They started here in Kansas in 2002. Midland became a second provider in 2007. Bluestem became a third provider in 2015. Um, it is just the basis of it. It is community based. So that really is the intent of PACE is to keep people at home living safely in the community. It is comprehensive and that everything that Medicaid and Medicare provide on a fee for service level is required to be provided in PACE. Third, it's a capitated program. So we get one rate for Medicaid, one rate for Medicare. It's our responsibility to take care of all the person's needs with that reimbursement. And it is slanted towards we are incentivized to keep that person at home, healthy, out of the hospital, out of a nursing home. If we do that, we're successful. If we don't, if we're paying $8,000 a month to a nursing home, then it's not. And then lastly, it's coordinated through our various uh, disciplines. Um, to be eligible for PACE, a person needs to be 55 or older, determined by KDATS or the ADRC to be eligible for nursing home care. They have to live in a PACE service area, which is about 20 or so can counties of, of 105 in Kansas. So Blue Stem and Emily provide services to six counties. Ascension provides and has uh, PACE centers in McPherson and an alternative one in Hutch. Uh, Ascension Living, Hope, what used to be known as Via Christi Hope has one on the western side of Wichita in Sedgwick County. And then we have pay sites and physical pay centers in Topeka, Lawrence, Kansas City, and, and Emporia. And then lastly, at the time of enrollment, a person has to be able to live safely at home. On day two of enrollment, they could have a, a health condition that requires them to go to the hospital, go to a nursing home. They would at that point stay in the program. We would pay for it, we'd coordinate it. But on day one, they have to be able to be assessed to live safely at home. Uh, all the services that have to be provided are here. Again, everything through Medicaid, Medicare. So the, the core components of this are an adult day center. So for us, that's again in Topeka, Lawrence, Kansas City, Emporia. For Blue Sim, it's in Hutch and McPherson. And uh, it, it is a, a, a very robust set of adult day center services. We provide transportation to and from the, the day center. Also at the day center, we have physician clinics. So we, we as a program have nine physicians and nurse practitioners that, that, uh, that see our participants, our 450 participants. So it's a very small caseload. So they know them minimally and personally and can help coordinate their care. And then all these other things are provided a lot of in-home support to keep them at home. Um, and they do it through an interdisciplinary team. 99% of those that we serve uh, have Medicaid. Uh, only about 1% are private pay. Uh, because of the way the program is set up. And then from, from those that we serve, the reason that we find people want to be on the program is it helps them remain at home, helps them maintain a maximum level of physical, social, cognitive functioning, allows them to have their care coordinated, and allows them to stay in familiar sound, sound, surroundings. From state or federal government's perspective, it's kind of better outcomes than not having PACE or in a fee-for-service world. So uh, people on PACE are have less than one ER visit a year. There's 20% less of a hospitalization rate than a comparable population. Only 5% of the people that we care for are enrolled into PACE, live in nursing homes. And then cost-wise, because of how the rates in Kansas are set to the Medicaid managed care companies, 
every person enrolled in PACE is, is a 10% savings in the state of Kansas compared to not being in PACE. So um, I how to stop sharing. Um, so that that is my, my PACE peddling or PACE propaganda. Uh, we are, so there's about 20 counties in Kansas that have it now. We are working with, with KDADS and KDHE, at least we as Midland, to expand into Johnson County, Miami, and Franklin County and have, have received that approval and start working with CMS in the state to do that. Uh, so there will be, a, a, we will add a fifth PACE program in, in Johnson County or PACE Center in Johnson County. Um, there has been significant growth in this program over the last two years in particular. So we as an organization have seen 25% increase in our enrollment just as interest has shifted more to at-home community-based care. Um, there, there are several barriers to, to making this a more relevant or prevalent program, however you want to put it or however you want to put it. Uh, and most of them are either federal regulatory or federal statutory barriers. Um, the first the first big one is that because of the way the, the, the financial system works, that again, only one to 2% across the country, and that's true for in Kansas as well, are not on Medicaid because the, the federal rules require a person that is not on Medicaid to pay the state Medicaid rate uh, as a copay. So if you have someone living at home, even with all the services that PACE provides, they're going to have a hard time being willing to pay the $3,500, $3,000, whatever it is, uh, to, to, to continue to do that and to go on to PACE. Uh, and then the second thing is we are also a Part D provider. Um, and for whatever reason, which doesn't make much sense at the federal level, um, they require PACE participants, if privately paying and, and not on Medicaid, for that one or two percent, uh, to pay eight hundred and fifty to nine hundred bucks per month to be for a Part D PACE plan, compared to what a person can get it for forty, fifty bucks in the private Part D market. So that that also is a significant barrier. Um, there is there is proposed legislation actually that was introduced yesterday by Senator Tim Scott and Senator Bob Casey for a PACE expansion act. That would eliminate those barriers, so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, and then at the state level, um, again, it's all mostly federal, federally driven as far as barriers, but I think as, as barriers are addressed and loosened and things open up, I think over the next six months to a year to two at the federal level, uh, and it becomes more of a prevalent option for people other than those are on Medicaid, although we love absolutely love serving uh, the group that we do now, or as it becomes more tenable to serve in pace or in rural areas, which there are limitations now at the federal level, um, what would help pace providers is, is really a day center component, um, but also kind of a supporting housing, uh, particularly in rural areas uh, to, for it to be a more of a prevalent option. So uh, there just are not, as, been, as I think has been noted in this work group uh, in previous meetings, there just are not a lot of day center options in a lot of places in Kansas. So we provide that in our pay centers, but um, there is it's just not a lot out there other than us and a few others in metro areas. So if we were able to find existing providers, whether it be clinics or hospitals or nursing homes or IDD providers that were willing to open up and allow, uh, whether it be a frail elderly day center option or a pay center option um, and, and, and retrofit some of their, what they're their settings were to, to 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 day centers. That actually would be, a, I think, a huge huge plus, particularly in rural areas, to be able to better serve people at home. And then the, the support of housing also also is a, a big piece as well. That's a little bit harder to crack. But uh, I don't know if that helped or not. But that's kind of what we see within Midland is kind of a both an overview, but also as a this is both state and federal barriers. Thank you, Sean. Worker members, what questions do you have? Especially implications to rebalancing HB, HCBS services. Annette Graham, Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Uh, it's a question for both Sean and Emily, and thank you for presenting this information today. But do you have, uh, so, so that's good to know, Sean, that over the last couple of years, there's been a 25% increase uh, in, in those served by Midland, do either of you have like statewide numbers of how many people are being served under the PACE 
model in Kansas? Sean Sullivan Midland, it's it's believe right now between 850 and 900, somewhere in that range. It's it's increased by probably 150 to just just at Midland alone. We've we've increased 150 to 175 in the last um, two years. So the others have been a little bit less than that. So it's it's somewhere in the 150 to 200 range. Any other questions or thoughts? And I don't want to take us off topic for this, but there was somewhat of a segue with Sean talking about adult day center services and that being your next topic that you'll talk about in March. As you're hearing about um, some of the senior daycare resources, are there data points that you'd want to hear more about or supplemental experts? just so we can get the ball rolling and inviting them to your March meetings. Jan, can we Go ahead, Jan. I was wondering, um, in, when the community that I live in, we have a senior um, community center and, and we have a meals program from Area Agency on Aging. Um, is there um, a study um, or, or, in, or information that says that, that that senior center aging with some type of support could also be an adult center with the PACE program of, um, attached to that because they're already bringing Area Agency on Aging is, is helping with the nutritional program and the site is there. But um, a PACE program um, with those support services, could that does, can that work together, or does all of these things have to be separate entities and standalones? Where where I live, you know, we just don't have a lot of standalones. We need to um, work together. And I, I didn't know if the the nature of a pace program adult center could coexist in the same. Um, build Sean in. Sullivan Midland. I'll, I'll provide at least my perspective. We we do contract pace contracts out certain services. So we are Midland is a Meals on Wheels provider for three counties. So in those three counties, we provide meals at our day centers for our our clients and pace. But in the other nine counties where we don't, we contract that out to, that out to nutrition providers similar to to who you mentioned. I, I do think that that especially in rural areas, we have to figure out ways to be innovative and that is to work with area, to work with AAAs, work with senior centers, work with existing providers to bring those constellation of services together so they're they're all available. And I, I do think the day center, as I said earlier, is a huge component of that for either people with dementia or just caregivers that need a break or just a little additional support that is needed. It's, it's a huge component of the PACE program and just it's it's not feasible for a pace program to go and establish a pace center in in all all cities or counties that we serve just because of that requirements for what has to be included in a pace center but there's nothing that says that we couldn't contract with the senior center who is serving as a day center or uh, if that were to be done in conjunction with a triple a or an existing provider in council grove that absolutely would be a, a potential solution Thank you. This is Linda Mowbray, Kansas Healthcare Association. I was hoping that we could have uh, uh, someone from KDATS talk to us about licensing requirements for adult daycare and give us some numbers on how many adult daycare homes have opened and closed um, in the last, you know, what, whatever we can access time-wise, 10 years perhaps. Uh, and and those adult care homes can serve, you know, they're licensed by KDADS. They they can serve private pay uh, if the individual has uh, long term care insurance. Sometimes there's a little bit of a benefit, not always. If the provider is enrolled in HCBS, they can provide HCBS day services. 
Um, so there's there are some things that are there, but there's also some barriers um, that are there from the licensing piece. And I think the the agency could probably describe those for us and and help us get our arms around what is there and and what else might might be possible. Hey Linda, just to clarify your question a little bit, um, you're wanting to know about the number of daycares in Kansas and what the barriers are? Um, no, the number that have opened and closed in the last 10 years. I think um, if you go out on the KDEDS directory, you can see the freestanding ones, but not necessarily the ones that are within a nursing facility um, themselves uh, or an assisted living themselves. Um, so, you know, what what do we have out there? And then what would be the barriers from partnering with a meal site um, to provide that type of daycare, day services, not necessarily PACE clients, but for other types of clients that may be use, using or would be able to use a freestanding or, or you know, a day center and a nursing home or whatnot. What what are those barriers to, I don't know, licensure or multi-use? Okay, I think that it helps clarify a little bit for me what I'm asking. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that before we? They kind of do work a little hand in hand with rebalancing HCBS services and kind of having some of these senior daycare resources. Heather Brown, Johnson County Developmental Supports. I just have a, a question and I'm not sure who can answer it, but mm -hmm. um, if, if there is an agency that's providing HCBS um, day services like an IDD provider, is there anything that stops them from also being a PACE day service provider at the same time? Sean Sullivan from Midland. So there's nothing that would prevent that I'm aware of a PACE program from contracting with an IDD PACE day center provider to answer your question. So I don't believe there would be. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions, data? Annette Graham, Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Um, so I know the question came up about how many uh, adult daycare providers there are. Is there any way to a certain how many people currently use that service? How many people are being served with an adult daycare setting? Um, I can circle back maybe, Dan, with KDA to see if that is um, a data point that's collected there, especially around licensing as well. Yeah, I'll put that on my list. I, I also, just to kind of circle back around on one of the questions that were asked earlier, that someone asked about the number of units for clients that were transferring from nursing facilities to community. It, that, that may be an opportunity. I think MCOs probably directly responding to that would be bad best um, and maybe they could be a potential uh, subject matter speaker at the future meeting to address that. Yes, Dan, we did um, reach out to some MCOs. It was just a scheduling issue, but they uh, we are able to get at least one or two to attend your meeting on the 28th, so later this month. And so um, I will definitely send that question to them so they can speak to it as you're developing your recommendations. Annette Graham, Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging, kind of in line with that whole transitioning topic, there has been a grant that has been uh, between KDAD's uh, Administration on Community Living and the ADRZ, um, and that has started November of 2020, uh, and, or 2021, 2020, 
these last two years kind of bled together for me, but uh, it has been extended through September of 2022 this year. And uh, it has been focused on transitioning individuals out of the nursing homes back to the community. Uh, it is a, a fairly small program, but I don't know if that might be helpful for people to hear because it's been pretty successful and it is for individuals that are both on Medicaid and in private pay. So it um, used this funding to help pay for some services to help the startup costs. That might be something to consider having a presentation on, a short presentation, to just kind of learn about that program and what that entails. And a contact for that, if you're interested in that, would be Leslie Anderson with K4AD. Is there interest in hearing from Leslie? Linda Mowbray, Kansas Healthcare Association. Um, I, I do think hearing from Leslie would be a, a great idea. Um, I'm not sure if Annette is, is speaking about what we used to call Money Follows the Person program, or if this is a different grant, um, but there had been a program, Money Follows the Person, um, that worked on transitioning individuals from nursing homes to the communities. And there was some success to that. Um, it wasn't utilized very, it didn't have high utilization. But if there is a, a speaker out there, you know, and again, it would probably be, be someone from KDADS that could speak to that um, historically. Um, I think that would be valuable information too. Annette Graham, Cape Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Linda, it is uh, somewhat similar, but it is it was a, a COVID-specific grant that came down through the Administration for uh, Community Living. So it did provide some enhanced uh, funding to help pay for some things. Uh, so it's somewhat similar to Money Follows the Person, but there was uh, a lot of follow-up and uh, assistance and coordination at that point of contact. There was some additional screenings that are done on the individuals once they're referred. And that transition is not just for older adults, although the primary, uh, the, this, the majority of people served have been old, but it's been opened up to people of all ages and whether they're on Medicaid or private pay. So that's some of the difference there. Yeah, and I, and just to follow up to Annette a little bit, I, I think that would be an opportunity for uh, Leslie and K4AD to speak to that uh, topic in general, um, the money follow the person and in, in, in some of the new stuff that AAA is doing or doing. So um, maybe maybe that'd be an opportunity for Leslie to present on money follows the person and and the new option as well. Thank you, I'll reach out to her. Any other thoughts? All right, well, coming back to um, rebalancing of HCBS services, I know that we attached the SWOT analysis um, to your agenda. So before I kind of have you guys go around for some closing thoughts on, you know, one thing you might want to highlight or add to the SWOT analysis based on what you've heard today and the discussion you've had today. I do want to give a few administrative updates. So one, you will be meeting next um, on February 25th, and that will be when you are um, putting together your recommendations on home and community-based services, so along this line. And then on March 11th is when we'll talk about the senior daycare resources at that point. Um, any questions on that? If you aren't able to attend a meeting, definitely let me know. Supplemental experts, thank you so much for joining us. You are welcome to come to that next meeting if you wanna provide any input with the recommendations as well. Um, but I am going to ask Emma is I think sharing the screen now. And so if you wanna go back up to the SWOT analysis, as we have about 15 minutes, you can expand a little bit here too. But I want you to look at those strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And as I call on your name, 
really think about one thing that you want to highlight in any one of these areas and if there's anything you want to add to the SWOT analysis after today's discussion. So I am going to start with Sarah and have her kick it off. Okay, let me think here. Let me see. Can you repeat your question of what you want us to kind of share? Yeah, so take a look at that SWOT analysis mm -hmm. and what's one thing you want to highlight in it? Um, and also, or what's one thing you want to add to it after today's discussion? Is there anything we that's missing? So we're going to use the same mechanism as you did in January, where you're going to use the SWOT analysis to really think through your recommendations. So is there anything that you heard today that you would want to add to this or that you really want to highlight so people keep top of mind as they come in to put recommendations together at your next meeting? Well, I really like the idea of maybe um, sharing resources or looking to see if we can be creative. Uh, we all support people, so how can we support them the best? Um, so I really liked that idea as well as, let's see, I think that goes along with maybe just the flexibility. Um, I know that, you know, I have a lot of experience in IDD, but I'm kind of hearing the same from everybody of really needing flexibility so that we can really achieve our mission, which is supporting people where they choose and having accessible um, services to do that. Thank you. Jan, did you want to um, go next? Um, I, I'm, look, I'm focusing at the moment on the weaknesses again and concurring service gaps between living on their own and then transitioning to more intensive support as they age. Um, that's in, in where in my community, that's what I, I see as, the, as an issue is that um, we don't have enough. Uh, so for in, in our county, our, our percentage of aging is higher um, than in, in some other counties, and we don't have enough support services for the percentage of us that are in this wonderful age group. And so I, um, looking at that, it's... Thank you, Jan. Jamie, do you want to go next? Yes, uh, Jamie Gideon with, Al with the Alzheimer's Association. And over on the threat section, um, I'm just talking about the final section session's role, um, causing assisted living and home plus to leave HCBS uh, services and providers. Um, just anything we could do to try to help prevent um, people having to unnecessarily leave um, and not be able to have access to HCBS services, I think would be good. Thank you. Dan? Well, I guess I would start with the strength that there is a lot of um, attention and, and potential resources and interest in in, in balancing uh, long term care, both you know in facilities and, and in the community. I guess one of the concerns I have about that is is this workforce issue, and we I'm 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 hopeful and, <laughs> and concerned that whatever we do, that um, we need to make sure that when we're, when, if we're looking at rates or uh, calibrating funding for these programs, that we try to look across the board because, um, you know, with, with reimbursement the way it is for personal care attendance and that type of thing, you know, if we do it for one side but not the other, we will create a unintended consequence of not having staff and resources to meet the needs of those folks, uh, whether they be in facilities or in the community. So I think we just need to be mindful of that so that um, all the PCAs don't want to run to one side of the room and then there's nobody over to serve the other side and create that imbalance. Thank you. Annette? So I would focus on the opportunity side, and I think that um, that whole work around transitions, the um, transition program and figuring out ways to continue that program uh, because it has been very successful. 
Uh, and then one that's not there also is just the uh, use of technology and how do we um, build that into our programs and fund for uh, use of technology to help people remain in the community. Thank you, Linda. Linda Bobrek, Kansas Healthcare. Uh, from today's presentations, uh, you know, I'm familiar with the PACE programs, but uh, um, I really think we need to highlight that, that opportunity um, of using the PACE model um, and, and trying to increase service areas. Uh, it, it, it's a model that works. Um, it's a model that has, has served many, many people, and uh, it would be, I think there is an opportunity and that we should highlight that. Thank you. Sean? Oh, it's hard to pick just one thing. I, you can pick a few uh, if you want. No, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I go back to several things already been said about limited service flexibility that need to be innovative. Uh, but, but to me, it's, it's really a desire to figure out how to better serve rural Kansas and address lack of access and, and opportunity for rebalancing there. And there certainly is a need to connect additional services or to have, a, have current providers, again, whether it be hospitals, nursing homes, AAAs, senior centers, uh, kind of be how to be better innovative and provide day center services or transportation or whatever else. But there also is an element where I'm going with this. There's an element of kind of care coordination or a, a robust care coordination model need that's there as well to be able to connect those constellation of services. So I all that to say, I would I would add in as an opportunity for robust care coordination as a need to connect services and be able to keep people at home, kind of taking the, the PACE model to uh, non-PACE areas, if that makes sense. Expanding the service areas, essentially, Sean. All right. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know that even would necessarily be expanding PACE service, PACE service areas, that'd be great. but. What PACE does of care coordination and connecting services and coordinating integrating care that can be done outside the PACE model, but it, it does. There, there is a huge piece with care coordination that is needed that I'm not sure is is there in a lot of places. So I, I would stick with the care care coordination theme would be kind of my my short bullet point. Thank you, Stacy. Stacy Carson, RN at Johnson County Developmental Supports. Um, I second the idea that um, Annette had of using technology to be able to keep people that are relatively independent at home for longer. And also, I think it's important to look at increasing funding for those, those personal care assistants to be able to keep people from moving to the more expensive uh, care areas. Thank you. Thank you. Heather? Um, I think one weakness, uh, sorry, Heather Brown, Johnson County Developmental Supports, one weakness that, um, you know, Shelly May kind of brought to light in her presentation um, was the, um, the tier rates, the functional assessment. I think that's definitely a weakness um, when we're talking about the IDD population, um, you know, and having that, you know, just not being a good tool to assess somebody's true needs and care. So I do think that that's, um, that's a weakness, the, the reimbursement rates and how that whole process is done. Um, to end on a, a more positive note, because I don't just want to focus on weaknesses, uh, something that's really sticking out to me um, on the opportunity side, <clears throat> we've got a couple bullet points there. I think it's the fifth one down now, but um, access to the same services. So when I asked the question about you know, can an IDD day service provider also provide PACE? Um, if that is something that can happen in conjunction with each other, I think that could help uh, more rural areas. But I also think that, you know, that's an opportunity to, uh, for providers to get more money coming in, more revenue generating from reimbursements and things like that. And I know that that could be applied to enhancing those services more. That could possibly be 
you know, used to enhance staffing pay and help with the retention and workforce issues. So I just think that that's a great opportunity that that should definitely be explored. Thank you, Tanya. Nice to go towards the end. Um, Tanya Dorf Bruner, Oral Health Kansas. Um, I, building on what everybody else is saying, I think uh, I'm really struck by um, the, it's close to the end of the opportunities uh, list there, the services that can be shared with HCBS and non-HCBS recipients. Um, I think it's, you know, built, it's, it's a variation on the theme of what everybody else has said, that what, what can we do to just to meet people's needs and regardless of the um, the category they may fit into or the fact that there's a waiting list or or any of those things. What do we what can we do to share services? What can we do to make access a lot easier um, kind of in all senses? So I think it's all variations. I also just, you know, highlight that all the pace um, pieces as well are important. So thanks. Thank you. And Emily, I know you haven't had a chance to really look at this, but did you want to say anything as a supplemental expert um, after looking at some of these and the discussion taken? What can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I, what I was saying was, um, having not seen this before, um, just to see the, you know, the SWAT, the the things that you guys have identified as being, you know, certain things that Pace would identify it as needs that are are shared amongst waivers. So that is really, really interesting to me, and I think. Um, just my one thought as far as, you know, the waiting list for HCBS services, um, you know, in in at least the Blue Stem Pace territory, uh, you know, a pace referral could be a great opportunity, you know, while someone's on a waiting list. So maybe, you know, the the IDD or, or, or you know, there's a, maybe there's another waiver that's, you know, the best fit, but could we serve individuals even if for a, you know, gap filling time with with paid services while they're you know waiting for something else and I don't know how that works as far as you know them being taken off the waiting list but it would be interesting to find a way to serve folks while they're in the waiting um, whether it's PACE or other services or programs you all are aware of thank you Emily and thank you to all of the working group members for a really robust conversation on this topic area and really thinking forward to the next topic area as well so that we can have um, good discussion for that as well. And they do somewhat overlap a little. Uh, be prepared next time. We will be using Google Jamboard. Um, so computers are usually better to be on uh, for that one. And then um, again, we will use the SWOT analysis and start forming recommendations. So come prepared with recommendation language as well. Um, and we will go through the exercise. Any questions for me before we depart? Well, thank you all again. And again, this is the Access to Care, Access to Services Working Group for the Senior Care Task Force. And thank you for a terrific meeting. We will see you later this month.